sing, don't we, the hymn of 284? The days are quickly flying and Christ will come again with all his saints attending, triumphant in his train. Yet how often in our busy day do we even think that way at all? And that what we're doing currently will all pass away. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, human beings? We're so focused on the here and now that we forget that the only thing that will matter is that we are part of the saints who will, with our Lord Jesus Christ, be there when he manifests himself to the world. It's an amazing calling, my dear brothers and sisters. The days are quickly flying. And we're about to enter into the last month of this year. And have you stopped to think of the readings over this month, November? In the New Testament alone, we've covered the rest of the book of the Acts. All the work that the apostles did in proclaiming the gospel message. Colossians, 1st and 2nd of Thessalonians, and the 1st and 2nd of Timothy. The book of Titus and today Philemon. The words that the Apostle Paul wrote for our admonition, but mainly for our encouragement. For God has not called us to fail, but to be part of that magnificent bride of Christ who is shortly about to return. And tomorrow we'll start reading the book of Hebrews. It's only going to take us a week to read the book of the readings. And yet there's so many powerful points in the book of Hebrews. It has to be one of my favourite books. When we learn all the shadow of the law was accomplished in the work and life of our Lord Jesus Christ. How much over this last month have we retained of the readings that we've done? All of Paul's exhorts? All the encouragements. What to do but to hold fast to the hope, to the faith that our loving God has placed before us. The love and the hope and the encouragement of one another. How much have we done that? Surely these have to be reflected in us personally in our daily walk. But how do we then fear in our daily work? Do we thank our Father many times in the day? Do we reflect on the wonder of our Lord's life, whom being exactly like us and tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin? Unbelievable, isn't it, my dear brothers and sisters? We don't have to think. We sin automatically. Or how we much do we speak and rejoice with each other on the great promises that we have been called to? How often on the floor of the Ecclesia do we encourage each other about a point in the reading that we found exciting? Unfortunately, I fear not often. And yet we are the people of this book. We are the ones who have been set aside by God himself. And the Lord Jesus Christ has promised that those that they have given to me, I have lost none, save the son of petition. Yet, my dear brethren and sisters, he wants every single one of us. And if we do the readings in Hebrews, we will see so many failed. Why? Because of unbelief. Sad, isn't it? When I sat down to write this excerpt, I looked at myself and my own personal life. And I look at the pressures of daily living. And I wonder about the young ones, my own children, and how they're bringing up the grandchildren and the pressures that's on them. These all tend to push aside the Bible lessons, the things that we read from the Word, get slowly but surely during the day pushed to the back burner. As the day unfolds, 
the things that are currently in our mind are the things that we have to do. It's called living, daily living. And the many things that have crept into our lives that push the Bible to the back burner are things that we're starting to take for granted. Our brother Mike mentioned the news. It's the worst thing we can listen to. Because every day it's doom and gloom. And yet we know, my dear brothers and sisters, that unless the three unclean spirits are not doing their work, there won't be a return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because those three unclean spirits are bringing this world to the great day of God's judgment. And we won't be here, will we? We will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be part of that magnificent bride of Christ. When the Lord is manifested, so will we be. And yet how often do we think of that? All the signs that are taking place in the world are evident that our Lord Jesus Christ will very soon be here. When we're taken to meet our Lord and we're assembled at the judgment seat, what will we be thinking about? Will we be worried that we've not been able to text our friend? Will we be worried that we left our cat or our dog behind? What will we be worried about? Will we be worried whether we're going to be found acceptable? Will we be worried that we don't know enough of the Bible? These things are very real. You speak to older brethren and sisters of what they worry about as they approach in death. It's an incredible thing that most of them worry whether they're going to be ever good enough to be in the kingdom of God. Well, let me give you an answer. No, we are not good enough. But as our chairman and many other brethren tell us, we are by grace going to be given eternal lives. What is the covenant for? Is Christ not faithful to it? Will he not be faithful to the covenant that we have made? Yes, my dear brethren and sisters, it's up to us, though, to believe it and act like we believe it. On Wednesday night, our brother Luke did a great class. And what did he stress? That the faithful walked with God. How much have we thought about walking with God since Wednesday night? I would like then by way of exhortation this morning for us to look at the book of Hebrews that we should be reading as I've said over the next week and Paul covers briefly the history of the Jewish nation in the early stages of it and the chapters of the deliverance of Egypt Moses who was taking them to the promised land under Joshua going into the land Paul then shows us that these two men were but a mere shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ who is our leader daily and that like them the people that they led it's so easy for us to forget that we're about to enter into a promised land and our rest mostly our rest when our Lord returns in all his righteousness in Hebrews 3 we read Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also was Moses, was faithful to all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than the Moses, insomuch as he who hath built the house hath more honour in the house for every man is built by every house or is built by some man but he that built all things is God Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant 
for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, for as a son over his own house, and note the next words, whose house are we? Why? If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Our commitment at baptism wasn't for five minutes. Our dedication as a bond servant indicated that we were going to serve him until the end. And so if we hold fast that confidence and rejoice with him in the end, the Lord Jesus Christ will be happy to count us as one of the saints. And how often do we think of that? We are all are we not in the household of Christ? God has always been the centre as the father to all generations, including ours. Being, us being in his house, we must also then hold fast. We need to read and understand why Israel failed in the wilderness. For they failed to enter into their rest the true rest of God is yet to come. And why did they fail? They erred in their hearts and forgot the plan and purpose of God. The plan and purpose of God is very basic, my dear brethren and sisters, and we all know it off by heart. This earth will be filled with His glory. Nothing to do with us. That's God's word. Our work is to preach the truth and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Very simple. But we have to believe that that's all it is. Our God calls every single one of us sitting here this morning. We are not worthy, but he has made us faithful and worthy because he wants us to be part and purpose of his plan. God says in verse 11 of chapter 3, So I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. He wants us to be in his rest. The rest that they were promised is the same rest that you and I were promised. It's the same rest that the Apostle Paul quoted and preached. So Paul goes on to exhort us in verse 12 to take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, whilst it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Deceitfulness of sin is something that's natural to our natures. So what does he say? For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And there it is again, unto the end. It's not a short walk, my dear brothers and sisters. It's to the end. For some, when they heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But the Lord was grieved with them for forty years. You know, did we notice twice the word today? Verse 13, verse 15. Do we have then in our busy lives time to consider the plan and purpose of our God? For this is our calling to be separate from the world, to be separate from the things that are about us. These are the things that we have to put into our minds. And this is the purpose of what a saint should be doing in our time of probation. Many in Israel failed. I have no doubt whatsoever that if we were walking in the desert for 40 years, we murmur. I tell you why I have no doubt. Because I know that we all murmur. And how many years have we been walking? Waiting in this world of evilness. And don't we find ourselves murmuring? 
We murmur about all the blessings that our God has given us. We mutter about each other. We mutter because we want the things of the world. And that's exactly what Israel did in the wilderness. Verse 19 says, and so, chapter 3, so we see then, they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. Do you know, when the Apostle Paul wrote this, I am sure that he was reading this words here. If I can find them. Somebody's pinched there at my Bible. One second. These words take heed. Come, let us sing unto Yahweh. Make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. And make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For Yahweh is great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth, and the strength of the hills is also in him. The sea of his is his. He made it with his hands, and he formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our Lord. He is our maker. He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, and to the sheep of his hand. And today, if ye will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. Unto them I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And so the psalmist back in Psalm 95, which we just looked at, understood Israel failed because of unbelief. And Paul picks up the exact points here. But Paul then changes. He changes his writing. So today we would look at each other. There's not one of us that could then or wouldn't dare condemn one another by saying, well, you won't be in the kingdom, will you, because of your attitude. It's not our job to judge each other, but to exhort each other to love and to good works, to love the Bible, and to love the hope that we have been separated and called to. And so therefore Paul changes text, and he says in verse 1, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of us, left us of entering into the rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So here's the contrast. He says, this is what's happened, but let us therefore fear. We don't come short of entering into his rest by just a one mere transgression. This word rest then, in Hebrews 4 here, is mentioned nine times from verses 1 to verse 11. Because this is what we are called to. Well, how often in our daily life do we think of the rest that has been promised to us? What is this rest? We all say the kingdom age, eternal life. It is a rest, my dear brothers and sisters, from sin. A rest from sin and all its labour that sin involves. The labour that was placed on Adam in the Garden of Eden because of his disobedience. That's the rest we look for. It's a rest for our minds to not think any evil that we're so prone to think. But instead have pure thoughts only can we even begin to manage to understand what that's about it will be a rest from having a mortal tired body that gets worn out that gets sick 
and eventually because of the wages of sin dies can you imagine what it will be like to have an immortal body it's a rest that will give us eternal life which not one of us can our mortal, in our mortal existence even begin to understand what that will be like to have an immortal body and an immortal mind that doesn't think of sin what an incredible wonderful unbelievable hope that we have been called to my dear brethren and sisters in this chapter 4 Paul gives us some advice on how we should and strive to obtain eternal rest with the Lord Jesus Christ with the simple words of let us which he uses throughout the rest of this book in Hebrews and during the readings this week highlight them there are 12 let us in the book of Hebrews as an education and as an encouragement and as a little prompt and so he reuses it here in this book and we'll only look at the first four of these let us that he uses in chapter 4 and so the first verse let us let us fear we can all understand the Proverbs when it says the fear of Yahweh the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge and understanding it's not a fear that we tremble and yet every time you see when an angel appears to somebody they drop to their knees and what will it be like when we fall with, stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm sure all of us will drop to our knees automatically. The glory that's manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ and his angels and God himself must be unbelievable. So the fear is not a terrif ter being terrified of not being there, but being beginning of the fear of how glorious they are. The second time is in verse 11. Let us labor. The third time is in verse 14. Let us hold fast. And the fourth time Paul uses it is in verse 16. Let us therefore. And so let's take the practicality of them. If we have fear or knowledge of our God's plan and purpose, we then can enter into the kingdom age of rest. The second time Paul uses it in verse 11, he tells us to labor, to labor to enter into the rest. So that why? We don't fall into unbelief. And we read that from verse 11. Take heed. Sorry, we've read that. The rest you fall. Oh, I'm reading the wrong one. Beg your pardon. Hebrews 4 and verse 11. Let us labor, therefore to enter into that rest lest any man should fall in the same example of unbelief for the word of God is quick powerful and sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Who's looking at us? Who's examining us? Who's exiting, uh, 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 sorry, guiding our footsteps? Isn't it the angel that's with us? Isn't it the word of God? And what does that word of God do? It cuts to the very marrow of us. Discerns us so that we may not be found naked. But you see, verse 13 says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. As soon as we read that word, doesn't our mind leap to Revelation 16? Verse 15, as a warning, when we see all the things taking place that the three unclean spirits are bringing on the face of this earth, that we may be not found naked. With clothes, my dear brothers and sisters, and a spiritual garment. 
given to us in the day of our baptism. We have to keep that garment clean. So then knowledge brings responsibility to labour in the word is to change our way of thinking from carnal thoughts to spiritual thoughts which takes us to the next let us for we read here in verse 14 seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast our profession hold fast to our profession what does he mean well, it simply means to hold fast to our confession. Our confession that we had at the day of our baptism that was given to us when we went through the waters of baptism to be baptised into Christ and that robe that was given to us that we still wear will be looked at when we stand before him. We believe at baptism that we are going to walk a life that is sinless before the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from our iniquities. Well, verse 15 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And how did the Lord Jesus Christ overcome sin? He often said, It is thus written, or have you not read? So what does that tell us, my dear brothers and sisters? That if we don't read and consider the Bible daily, our minds are going to be filled with rubbish. For whatsoever we pour in there, that's what's going to come out. Let us never deceive ourselves. That is so true. Our Lord does know our shortcomings. Our Lord hasn't called us to not to be in the kingdom of God but surely when he looks at our minds and our hearts he wants to see something manifested in there that reflects this father which is what it's all about isn't it in our time of probation and so he says then the Lord knows therefore after we read verse 15 verse 16 says our understanding of God's grace is to us and therefore let us therefore let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy, find grace to help in time of need. And isn't it that's what we need? Our time of need is always now, my brethren and sisters. It's not only in a crisis, but daily it's now. This, in our lifetime, this time is in our probation. Time as we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Let us work out our salvation with fear. That's knowledge of God and his plan and purpose of offending also a fear of offending the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. The other warnings that Paul comes from these two chapters of 3 and 4 in Hebrews is the word today which we've looked at. And so we read in verse in, in 3, verse 7, Today, if you hear it's not. So these things stand out. Verse 7 and verse 13, we've already read. Verse 15, again. Today, today, today. And that was the whole problem in the children in the wilderness. They forgot today to serve their God. A murmured. And chapter seven, uh, sorry, chapter four, verse seven. Again, we read. Again, he limited the day, saying to David, "Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. What's going to mellow your heart? What's going to make you mould, be mouldable, and be presentable to our God?" The word itself and only the word. Twice it says in verse four, uh, verse 7. Today. We are living in today. Surely Paul's words for us are clear. Today. While we still have time to do so. 
Consider our ways and how we do spend our times and what we spend our times in doing. Today, while we wait for the Lord, we must hold fast, encourage each other, and be taught of the gospel message, the message of salvation. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, if you take nothing away from this exhort, take these words. Let us fear our God in love. Let us labour to enter into that rest. And let us hold fast to our confession, believing that we will be in the kingdom. And so it is, as we now turn our thoughts to the emblem set before us. I'm sure you, like me, feel completely unworthy of even being called. And yet we have been called because God sees something in us that he wants to use in the kingdom. But looking at the emblems, by being here, we are renewing our covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. For he said, do this in remembrance of me. We are washed again by the blood of Christ, symboled in the wine. We are called to be part of the body of Christ, symbols for the emblem of the bread. We all have been given by God an amazing hope, and an amazing, incredible way in which we can walk. Let us in as an ecclesia. We say we manifest love. But what sort of love do we manifest to each other? Is it to encourage us to stay and keep in the way by speaking one to another about the great hope we hold and how we can hold on to it? Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, which we read nearly every week, tells us to let a man examine himself let a man examine himself. And we just read there that the word of God will pierce and cut asunder in chapter 4, verse 12. It tells us that the word is a discerner of our thoughts and intents of our heart. Do we think of those things as in our daily walk, we walk unworthy of our Lord? So let us now then take of these emblems, believing, believing for certainty, that this may well be the very last time that we can take of these emblems before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And then the next time we'll take of the wine will be with the Lord Jesus Christ at the marriage sup of the Lord with all his holy angels and all those like us who have been redeemed. indeed exhorted us to look forward to the uh, promised eternal rest that is set before us and we know brothers and sisters that this promise has only been made possible by the sacrifice of the greatest man ever to have walked this planet even the Lord Jesus Christ and so it's also the Apostle Paul that talks about these emblems set before us and we read from that section in 1 Corinthians 11 as a uh, precursor to taking these emblems. For the Apostle Paul says this in the verse, first verse, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. He goes on to say, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had broken when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread 
and drink of that cup. We'll give thanks for the bread. Our gracious or wise Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence focusing our attention at this time upon the memorials on this table and in particular this bread. We are truly thankful, dear Father, for providing thy Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Father, we know that thy Son was able to call upon thee for strength when it was required and it helped him live that wonderful and perfect life of obedience. And while we know that we can never measure up against his perfection, nevertheless, dear Father, we ask that thou would also help us to likewise call upon thee for the help in time of need so that we can try all the more in these very last days to crucify our lusts and to follow thee. So please help us to be like thy son and to remain steadfast to the end and forgive us of our ongoing sins and help us now to examine ourselves as we take this bread. We thank thee, dear Heavenly Father, and we come into thy presence through thy Son, the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. So it's recorded that Jesus took the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. now give thanks for the wine. Once again, dear Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence to thank thee for this wine, a symbol of the innocent blood that was shed on our behalf by thy Son. We know it was shed in great agony, Heavenly Father, for our sakes. It also represented in this wine as a new way of life that 
Every one of us here are now partaking of the emblems promised to try and live from the day of our baptism. And so as we now take this wine, cause us to reflect on not just the past week, but more importantly on the week to come, that we might put in place some measures in our life that will greatly please thee. We praise thee and thank thee now for the opportunity of partaking of this wine and come into thy presence through thy Son, the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. So Jesus took the cup and he said, This is the wine of the new covenant. Drink ye all of it. memorial hymn this morning is hymn number 238.
gracious, all-wise Heavenly Father, at the close of our meeting, we come again into thy presence to echo those words which we've just sung, to please dismiss us with thy blessing, with the joy and the peace that can only come from thee and thy word. We have indeed been encouraged this morning, dear Father, to hold fast to the promise of the rest that has indeed been promised to us from thy word. Help our unbelief, dear Heavenly Father. And while we cannot dispute the incredible signs in this world that clearly prove thy son's return, nevertheless, sometimes we feel that our faith is struggling. We do live in a very safe and a very stable country, dear Father. For that we are truly thankful. But such a lifestyle brings with it our daily challenges of trying to walk in a way that would please thee, trying to walk in a way which would have us yearning for thy son's return. One wonders, dear Father, if we were living in Africa, if we were living in India or Iran or Turkey or many other places where our brothers and sisters are on bended knee pleading for thy son's return every day. Nevertheless, we do know that our life is really temporary. Our true life to come is the true rest that has been promised to us. And our brother Lionel reminded us this morning that it is soon to come. It is soon to be presented to us and we do pray for it to happen. Please be with our families, loving Father. Parents today bringing up children in this world have an incredible challenge and a responsibility. Please be with them. Be with our older members that we will be a source of encouragement to the younger ones. And be with our children and our grandchildren that they will see through the technological age in which they live that thy word is very special and it is worth holding on to and so then Heavenly Father we close our prayer coming boldly and freely unto thy throne of grace seeking mercy and grace and we do so through thy dear son the Lord Jesus the Christ whom we know is listening to our prayers through his name Amen
joy to God. Tell you what he